QuickBooks Online 2023 e-commerce inventory Excel weighted average practice problem part number two. Get ready to earn the skills needed to boost your bank books on up with QuickBooks Online 2023. Here we are in our QuickBooks Online test company file using the accountant view as opposed to the business view. You can toggle between the two views by going to the cog up top and switching the view down below, duplicating some tabs to put reports in like we do every time. Right click on the tab up top to duplicate it. We'll duplicate again, right clicking and duplicate once again back to the middle tab reports on the left opening up one of the favorites which of course is the balance sheet report as it's thinking tab into the right reports on the left closing up well let's hold on a second profit and loss then close up the hand boogie then we'll change that range from 0401 uh two three to 053123 that's the time frame we're working with this time there's our profit and loss thus far Tab into the middle, closing the hand boogie, scrolling up and ranging to the changing, the same range as before. Oh, 40123 to 053123 and run it. Back to the tab to the left, noting that we're doing an e commerce situation, selling inventory, but not on ground in a store, but rather online in the cloud with the help and use of third party software, such as a Shopify or an Amazon, for example. We're breaking out. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as excel practice problems pdf files and more like quickbooks backup files when applicable so once again click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it the sales side and the inventory tracking side tracking our inventory on a periodic type system with the help and use of an excel sheet that's going to be doing it in a weighted average method we started last time doing this and if you weren't following along then you probably want to see that one first because we're continuing with month number two of this exciting saga of uh, of the inventory so <clears throat> Now we're going to go back in here. Now, last time we entered this in, but I didn't make it into a formal table. So now I'm going to do month number two, but we'll, let's make this into like a formal table now. So I'm going to select this whole thing. I want to make sure it picks up everything in here. I'm just going to make it into a table, which has its pros and cons for adding new data. I feel a little bit more secure when it's actually in a table format that it's not uh, messing things up but sometimes it copies formulas in a way that you don't really like as well so there's pros and cons but we're going to select the whole thing and go to the home tab or not the home tab i'm in the home tab i'm going to the insert tab tables and i'm just going to make it into a table and so it's all selected that looks good uh my header has it has a header good and now it made it really wide because it 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 uh it extended all of the headers so now I'm going to reformat all of my headers to be basically the length uh, that I want them to be. So we'll redo all of the headers, which yes, is a little tedious, but it's okay. It's okay. We're going to just make this nice and tight. Boom. Bring that in a bit. This one needs to be in a bit. I should probably make this exact to the other one from the other area, but there we go now notice it also on the table headers when i made it into a table it it put a little number by each of the headers so it's distinguishing each of the headers because i had repeat header names now you might want to go in into each of these header fields and change these numbers to be like uh product two like all of these i might put all of these to correspond with a number two for product number two and what that could do is it could help us if we were ever trying to create a fancy pivot table or something to distinguish our headers here. So I'll change all these to product number two, poor example. And so let's do that. 
and then let's make this skinny and this skinny and then this one i might change all the headers to like product number three i'll just put a three next to all the repeat headers so that if i was to make a pivot table that i wanted to do something fancy with then i could know which headers go where number three and there we go double click number three almost done mui sarka number three and this one number three and let's bring these in a bit as well all right so there is our table okay so now we we did the first month of uh of april of our operations and now we're going to continue on the second month and we're just going to to buy stuff as we need it so we're following along with our shopify or our online store and we're looking at the units and seeing if we have the units that we need to to meet the need and we're saying that that we're getting short on some of the units so we're going to make a purchase in may so we're going to make the purchase and just record them on a cash based system so let's say on five one and notice as i add five one it added another cell to my table and it pulled down most of the cells that i want to pull down automatically didn't pull this one down but notice it it's getting more automatic that's the point so this is going to be product number one which is going to populate kind of automatically once i start to populate it let's say that we're going to buy six more of these ones so now this is populating automatically because it's this plus this which is just six now and then we're going to buy them for the cost and i'm going to say that we buy them for 23 units each 23 dollars each now if i bought this and I paid $138 plus the sales tax generally, it's going to be included in the cost usually, then I could say 138 divided by six would be 23 per unit, right? I might have to do that kind of the other way. And then I'm going to copy this down just so I can have my formula and it's not doing anything because this isn't a sales formula. This is the purchase side. So this is the total cost and here's our total ending balance there was nothing in it before so that's where we stand at this point and then on product number two we're not buying any product number two or product number three at this time so let's just make sure that everything copies down like they should on these other ones so all the columns copy down so everything's copying down that needs to except for this one i'm going to copy that down and then same thing over here. So let's just copy this one down. And there we have it. Now the totals look good because now the the total is totaling up these ending balances. And then the change is gonna be this minus this, which also, sh uh, so, so that's gonna be the purchase that we're gonna make, which also ties out to this number. So let's record the purchase in uh, QuickBooks now and once we do the purchase then our ending inventory will change by that be up to 2948 so we're currently at 2810 so if I go back on over here and say QuickBooks reports we're at 2810 we're going to make a purchase which we would see come through the bank feeds if we're on a cash based system I'm just going to represent that with an expense form and we're gonna say that that we're paying let's just use vendor number one again that's who we buy stuff from and this is going to be on five one and inventory is the other side and we just purchased the how much was it again do you remember how much it was i forgot i'll tell you that 138 138 thank you 138 okay so this is going to increase inventory other side going to decrease the checking account let's save it close it check it out and go to our balance sheet running the balance sheet we should have a decrease to the checking account and let's see this on a side by side by the way hitting the drop down month by month side by side and we can see kind of our inventory at the end of april and then we made a change in the inventory purchasing it here and then uh the other side's on the checking account no impact on the PL. let's go to the PL and let's check that one out in a month by month side by side as well so nothing on the uh the, this one should this is the sales i'm on the cost side so nothing's on the cost of goods sold for may thus far okay so let's go back on over here and 
the ending balance, by the way, is that 2948. Let's just double check that. And 2948. Yes, indeed. It is correct. Okay, so more time passes, we're imagining. And sales are happening over here on the Shopify store. And they're ticking down the sales numbers in terms of units as they happen. But we're not worried about recording a decrease to the inventory on our financials yet because we're only going to do that periodically at the end of the month. However, we are concerned with the units of the sales as they tick down and we're going to make purchases, you know, as we need to, to try to meet uh, the demand. So we're going to say, okay, we think based on what the store is saying here that based on the units, we need to buy some more units. So I'm going to go, okay, we're going to, let's see which units we need to buy on 515. And this is going to be product number one again. Let's say on 515, we buy two more units. And this time they cost $27. Notice the cost per unit is rising. And I'm just, it might not rise this rapidly, but typically the cost will rise as time passes because of inflation and whatnot. And that's why you need the flow assumptions. So if I copy, let's just copy this down. And there we have it. So now we, pur we purchased two times 27 each. It's going to cost us $54. Ending inventory was at 138 plus the 54 is now at the 192 for product number one and then product number two we also purchased this time uh let's say we purchased three units of uh product number two so let's say i'm just gonna put it here product two and we're gonna purchase uh three units so the total units are up to five now for product number two and then uh, and hold on a second. I don't want it here. That happened on 515. So let's put it here. Product two. And then here's my two. Okay. And then, so everything's carrying down four units total now. And then nothing's here. And then I'm going to copy this down. And it's doing nothing because, because this is a purchase and not a sales item. And then the, the total cost actually this needs to be what am i doing here this needs to be then what we purchased them for we we purchased them for 111 so the cost went up we had to pay 105 per unit now we're paying 111 per unit okay and then the, there's the total two units times 111 gets us 222 ending balance is the 210 plus the 222 gives us the 432 ending balance for product number two and then product number three, did we buy any product number three on, uh, th we did. We're gonna say product three, we also purchased. And we're gonna purchase three of those and they cost us now 675 to purchase those ones. So they went up again, inflation happening, hit us again. I'm gonna copy this one down and then total cost is three units times 675 prior balance plus the current change gives us this number and then our totals which are the ending balances there's where we stand each of the ending balance for product one two and three and here's the change that happened in other words this is the purchase price so we're purchasing 2301 of inventory which we're breaking out on a per unit basis for products one two and three so that's what we have thus far so i'm going to just pay i'm going to imagine we buy it all from vendor one we might have multiple vendors that we buy different types of products from uh, but i'm going to imagine we buy them all from vendor one here so i'm going to say all right we bought all this stuff to to uh put in our store and so we're going to see it decrease the checking account again vendor number one and vendor number one is we're making vendor number one rich and we're gonna say this is gonna be for the amount, uh, but we're getting rich too, so that's cool. I'm cool with that. Uh, 2301, 2301, 2301. And so this is gonna decrease checking, the other side's going into inventory. So we'll save and close it and balance sheet it and run it. Checking account going down, other side, assets now up to 5249. And that ties out here to our ending balance in our worksheet. 5249, MUI B to the end, BN, as they say. 
All right then. So then let's say that at the end of the year, then, uh, or at the end of the month now, we are going to, we're going to do our, our physical count again. So what's been happening is we've been selling our stuff on our third party store here and their inventory tracking has been going up and down on a perpetual system. And we're just recording the purchase side, but not the sales side in our financial statement on a dollar amount using the weighted average method. And now we're gonna say it's the end of the month. So we're gonna do a periodic adjustment to make our financial statements correct periodically. We're gonna look at the physical count as well as which could also be reflected or shown here on the Shopify as we manage our physical count of inventory and the difference between the physical count and what's in our books at this point in time in terms of units, we imagine we sold those, right? So that's the periodic system. So we're gonna say, okay, then let's go back on over and, and, and say this happens on 531. We're gonna adjust our books with a journal entry, product number one, and we're gonna imagine that we only have four units left. We've counted our inventory. We looked at the physical count and the Shopify count in units. We got four units left. I have eight units here. That means we decreased the units by four. We sold four units to get the unit count down to four. And then we're not gonna have any buying thing because we didn't purchase anything. So I'll keep that at zero or I might just put a zero into the field. And then I'm gonna copy this down. Now look what it's doing because we have our fancy formula. It's, it's now saying, hey, look, this because that's zero or less than zero, I'm going to do this number, which is our which is our ending balance right before this this transaction divided by the number of units. So we've been buying stuff. It cost us $20, 22, 23 and so on up to $27. The average at this point in time is the ending inventory for product number one divided by the number of units before we selling them at this point, which is about $24, right? And then we've got our total ending balance, which is gonna be, uh, now it's this uh, 20, so it's C9, C9 times uh, E9, but there's nothing in E9, so it's C9 times F9. So it's these two are what's being calculated here, the second half of that formula. And then the ending balance is the 192 minus, because it's a negative number, gets us to the 96 remaining. Okay, we also, did we sell any, we didn't even sell any of product number two, which is a bust, no one wants it. No one wants product. Product two, no one wants you. <laughs> See how that rhymed? Product two, no one wants you. Oh, burned, burned product two. Okay, so we got product number three and we're gonna imagine that uh, we have two units left. So we checked out our physical count and what's on our Shopify physical count, two units left. So we have to say seven minus two, that means we sold five units. So five units brings us down to two. Seven minus five gives us the two. Nothing here. I'm gonna copy this formula down, which is gonna do this, gonna say that was zero. So I, what I want you to do then is to take the uh, four, six, two, five, the total value of the inventory divided by how many units we had before this transaction and that gives us an average cost of the 660 remember they cost us 650 and then 675 but the weighted average 660 at this time so then we're going to say that means that this times that is going to be the the uh the 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 decrease 330357 Ending inventory was at 4625 minus the 330357 gets us the 132141. The ending balance at this point in time represents the ending balance in each of these products. And then the change is the journal entry we need to make to get to get our ending balance and our financial statements down to the current ending balance according to our calculations here. So that's going to be the journal entry number. So if I look at my Financials, we should be at 5249 now. So if I go to five, if I go to my fi financials, we're at 5249. We're going to bring it down to the 
1849.43 by decreasing inventory 339.957, assuming we sold that and recorded the other side to the expense account of cost of goods sold on a, a an accrual. That's an accrual concept, right? So now we're doing the accrual thing with a journal entry, not the cash based thing. And so we're going to go back on over here and just make a journal entry. There it is, journal entry as of the end of the month, 531, 531. And we're going to say this is going to be cost of the goods that are sold, cost of the goods and the amount being, what did I say again? Do you remember? I forgot again. 3399.57. That's about the max of my memory. 33, but there's two double digits. 339957. 3399.57 because if you memorize like 3399 then those are like one digit memories so i can remember seven double digit numbers instead of so i should be able to rem remember more than seven digit whatever inventory decreasing 339957 all right that's it recording the expense other side decrease in the inventory let's save it let's close it let's run it the balance sheet that is that's what we're running and check it out so if i go on to the balance sheet inventory going down as of the end of may to the 184947 does that tie out to what we have here 184943 we're off by some uh by a bit here some pennies no no 184918 184943 no you're just doing some stupid you can't you're the numbers changed when i looked at them that it's not that the numbers changed or something i don't know but now it's correct so then we'll run it this one and then down here we've got the cost of the goods sold at and notice i put this one into cost of labor again that's not correct let's just change that let's change that that probably bothered people people are going to be upset on that one so i'll fix it now they're still going to be upset they're still going to be upset but this will at least we'll fix it we'll fix it okay okay let's do that so then now we've got the cost of goods sold uh here okay so there it is and then we record the cost of goods sold so the bottom line is the income is going up separate from the inventory tracking we're not doing it on a perpetual system we're basically using whatever system we talked about in prior presentations to pull the information on the income side of things and now we're using the weighted average method to get a proper cost of goods sold as best we can on a periodic system so that we can basically look at our financial statements in this case on a monthly basis at the end of the month and get some numbers that are going to hopefully help us for better decision making purposes into the future and as you track your information over here on your worksheet and whatnot as well you can also of course get a better idea possibly of your profit margins and whatnot on a on a product by product basis so you can then determine you know which products are not just selling best but also which products are most profitable when you take into consideration you know the profit margin and whatnot i mean obviously here if you've got a product over here that you know costs a lot more and whatnot you would think that maybe the profit margins might be better on the you know if you could sell so 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 the more data could help with those types of calculations so in any case the two major flow assumptions that we can we can use will generally be the first in first out which we took a look at in a prior presentation and then uh, a weighted average uh, type of flow assumption we took a look at this time now just for the fun of it let's take a look at because i did this one in 2023 and the last one in 2024 i believe let's change our report to total only and then i'm going to go to uh the the, the periods and I, I wanted to select the uh previous year previous year and then i'll do the change here so i can compare actually wait a sec let me do it this way i've got to change the date up to 2024 2024 that's when we did the fifo and then i'll do the previous year change in dollar change in percent and run it and so so now we've got uh uh april 
and May 2024, and then April and May 2023. And if we go down to the cost of goods sold, you can see the cost of goods sold is not exact, right? Because we use, I, I believe uh, in the prior presentations, we did the same, uh, the same flows, sales and purchases using a first in first out method. And here we used, you know, a weighted average method. So you can get into the details of which is gonna be more advantageous if you have a period of, of increasing prices such as we had here with the uh with inflation which is typically the case meaning the cost of the inventory is going up and your flow assumptions will then have an impact on uh your cost of goods sold and and the general idea would be if you if you use the first in first out kind of flow assumption then that would mean that you would be selling the items that are cheaper right and your balance sheet would be holding on to the inventory that you purchased latest which usually would be the most expensive if you're in an inflationary or increasing price type of system so you would think that the first in first out system will result in a bigger number in the uh, ending inventory and then the ones that you sold would be a smaller number in you know the cost of goods sold because you're selling the items that in essence are cheaper right would be the general idea and then the weighted average is kind of taking the middle one and then you've got first the last in first out which would be the opposite of first in first out which no one really uses generally for practical purposes because it doesn't really make sense from a flow assumption but you know it could it could make sense from a tax <laughs> a tax standpoint so in any case those are the that's the general idea.